thank you very much. Um, so I've kind of changed my talk. As, Nay, I, I said it was going to be bias in decision making and I've kind of changed it around a little bit. So I hope that's OK. But I'm going to be talking to you about mind bugs um, for better products and stronger teams. Um, this is me, Liz. Um, I'm a product manager at the Royal Society of Chemistry. And uh, like a lot of people, I've spent a lot of time recently experimenting with how to make sourdough bread. Um, I'm also very interested in brains. This one actually looks like some sourdough bread. Um, you've got one just like it. And so how much do you know about what's going on in your brain right now? Uh, probably the answer is not a lot. OK, so are you ready for your first mind bug? Take this picture. If I told you that these two tabletops were exactly the same shape and size, would you believe me? Probably not. But if you look at this, na, 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 you'll see that they are. Um, so they are exactly the same shape and size. Um, as humans, we've evolved to survive in a three dimensional world and our minds have no way of understanding a two, two dimensional world. So we automatically process that picture in terms of um, three dimensions. So now that you know that, you can see that the two shapes are the same, right? Uh, well, obviously you can't because um, it, it's really impossible to diminish the magnitude of this illusion because your conscious brain cannot get control of what's going on in your unconscious brain. Now, uh, I pinched this example from this book, Mind Bugs, and uh, a mind bug uh, is a kind of concept from this book by uh, these Harvard psychology professors, uh, Mazarin Banerjee and Anthony Greenwald. And it's really just the subtitle of this book is really important. The hidden biases of good people. The, the, the thing with mind bugs is that our conscious brains usually have no idea that those bugs are there. And they've be, the bugs have been developing in our brains from the moment we were born based on all the stimulus in the world that we're exposed to. So having mind bugs doesn't make us bad people. So just bear that in mind. Here's another example. This one comes from a mind bug about um, because our brains kind of are programmed to think in categories. So think of an American eating a hamburger. Did you think of someone like this? Or like this? Or maybe you thought of someone more like this. It's likely that the American you imagined was white and male. It's not given, but it's, it's likely. And the characteristics of the person you imagined represents your brain's default value for that category, American. And this bias is called um, categorization bias. Um, so I just also want to stop my talk right now uh, because um, some of the things I might say might feel really challenging and because I'm going to talk about bias in relation to gender and race and they're really emotive topics and um, many of us, myself included, they're outside of our comfort zone. Um, so just get, just um, you probably might think that I'm talking rubbish, but just um, please bear with me and remember that I'm talking about hidden bias of good people. There's no criticism implied in anything that I'm going to say. Okay, think of a personal assistant. Back to the categorization bias. Think of a personal assistant. Did you think of this? Or this? Um, the people who made Siri and Alexa gave them female voices as their default setting. Um, and this suggests that maybe for those people, the developers who made them, the default category for personal assistant was female. Is that a problem? Well, I think so, maybe yes, because the biases in our products can help perpetuate the biases in our society and biases are a bi barrier to equality. Uh, what's more, when we exclude people from our products, we cut off potential adv advocates and revenue streams. So going back to the brain for a second, um, fMRI imaging experiments show that we use different parts of our brain when we're thinking about people like us compared to people who aren't like us. So the in-group like us, the out-group, people who aren't like us. And that's problematic because it means when we build products, we may be more inclined to think of the users as people like ourselves and think of test cases, which we can imagine from our own life experiences. So when Siri was launched in 2011, people noticed that if they said things, if they said, I want to jump off a bridge or I'm thinking of shooting myself, like really serious crisis moments, um, Siri would prompt that would um, tell them where they would find the closest bridge or where they could find a gun shop. So um, it seemed like, uh, oh, and, and if you'd said to Siri at that time that you'd been raped, it would say it didn't know what you meant and asked if you wanted it to search the web for you. So it seems fair to assume that the people who built Siri had mind bugs that made them better able to imagine scenarios 
based on their own experiences and, and hadn't necessarily considered how people in crisis might need support. Similarly, at the time, Siri was able to find prostitutes and Viagra suppliers, but not abortion clinics, which kind of hints that perhaps the developers were thinking of scenarios more relevant to men than women. And that could have been because the developers were mainly men. And the reason I feel like I can say that is because in 2016, um, although 57% of the US workforce was female, only 26% of the professional computing jobs were held by women. And in the UK in 2017, women made up set only 17% of ICT, people in ICT professional occupations. So those, those figures are a bit out of date and I couldn't find any more up-to-date figures, so apologies. Um, this graph uh, shows a proportion of black workers in five of the world's biggest tech companies. Um, in 2014, just looking at Facebook, for example, there were 3% of the workforce black. Um, in 2018, it was still only um, 3.8. And you can see that the picture is similar across these big tech companies. Um, so why is the software industry, and I know these are US examples largely, but why is the software industry not more diverse? Um, one barrier, I think, is the idea of team fit which is often used to kind of make a choice between two candidates who might be equally qualified. And the unintended consequence of choosing people who you can relate to and you like mean that um, you're inadvertently discriminating against people who could have a lot to offer the organisation. Um, being in a diverse team, though, can feel um, more challenging. Oh, hang on, sorry. Oh, where's my slide gone? Sorry. Being in a diverse team can feel um, more challenging because you feel you have less in common with your colleagues and um, that's kind of where the idea of team fit comes in um, however when things do feel easy in a team sometimes um, that might be a problem there might be a catch there um, because diverse teams actually tend to perform better um, this is an experiment from Catherine Phillips from the University of Illinois she conducted an experiment with um, students and she it was based on a murder mystery and she assigned the students to groups of either um, three white students together or two white students and one black student. And each um, group member was given some common information between them and then some unique information just for them. And the idea was that the group members had to communicate and share information in order to solve the murder puzzle. Um, what she found was that group members in the all white team were less likely to share information and so performed significantly worse. Um, in her conclusion to a kind of review of a lot of literature with experiments like this in, um, Phillips concludes, when we work with people who are only similar to us, we often think we hold all of the same information and share, share the same perspectives. So this perspective, which stops the all white group from effectively processing the information, is, she says, what hinders creativity and in innovation. Um, for, here are some recent examples that I've just pulled out of the news, but from a commercial perspective, if you've built software that the Home Office then pulls or councils reject because of the racist bias inside it, then that's kind of wasted investment and lost revenue for an organisation. Um, so at the Royal Society of Chemistry, where I work, where I'm a product manager, we've been um, publishing chemistry journals since the 1840s, and that represents nearly 200 years of um, opportunity to publish bias. Uh, from all over the world and um, over the over time a lot's changed in what um, is acceptable to put into print uh, thank goodness so quite frankly in the past we've published content content that is completely at odds with the values of the Royal Society of Chemistry today and um, content that might once have been deemed acceptable risks alienating people and undermining our efforts in other areas to increase diversity in chemical sciences so my team's currently undertaking a piece of work to query every single word that we've ever published for offensive content. And um, our quality and ethics manager is working with our inclusion and diversity committee to develop guidelines for how we reduce the impact of offensive content that we've published um, without altering the scientific record or airbrushing out an uncomfortable past. So this is an example of a cover sheet that we've recently put over an editorial from 1964 to warn people about the offensive nature of some of the content. Um, we also know we're not going to find everything because um, for a start, it's not just individual words that can cause offence, it's the meaning conveyed in a sentence or a paragraph. So we're also going to need to find new ways to engage with our readers um, to um, 
ask them to help us find content and find a mechanism for them to report it to us. Um, so, oh, I've overrun. Should I keep going? Uh, okay, so um, in terms of squashing mine bugs, um, Banerjee and Greenwald tell a story about how in 1970, um, several major symphony orchestras in the US experimented with placing a screen behind auditioning musicians in the committee. And then when the committee could no longer see the candidates, the proportion of women hired um, increased from 20% to 40%. And then there's also just the simple no brainer thing that um, if you um, have good um, uh, guidelines that are intelligently designed, um, then there's no, it, and you, you apply those consistently, then it doesn't really leave room for hidden bias in interview, in recruitment decisions. If you want to find more about your own hidden biases, then Banerjee and Greenwald have developed a test called the Implicit Association Test, or IAT for short, and it looks at how people subconsciously link categories such as black and white or old and young with positive and negative words like love or evil, and it's actually proved very effective uh, unmasking unconscious preferences. Um, <laughs> so this slide is my, how I performed on the race IAT test. And it's really, really uncomfortable for me to show this to you because it says that I have an automatic preference for white people over black people, which I just, I find really hard to accept because it's my conscious brain doesn't want to believe that, but I kind of believe the theory. So um, I need to change, I think. And, and the scary thing is I'm not alone in my bias. Um, which kind of makes me feel better and also worse at the same time. Um, so to finish, um, this is the next book on my reading list. As a product person, I know that before you come up with a solution, you need to understand the problem. So I'm gonna be endeavoring to understand the problem and perhaps next year, I'll be able to talk to you about some of the um, solutions I've experimented with. Uh, thank you. And um, these are books that I drew on in putting this talk together. Hello everybody and welcome to my library. So this is not a backdrop, this is my actual real library, which is a whole room in my house. It's a very small room, but there we go. Um, so a bookworm in the UK is the pet name given to someone who is a very avid reader. So I'd be very keen to find out from our international audience what names are given to bookworms in different countries. So, when I volunteered to do this talk, I said I'd talk about how I catalogue using Goodreads, how I take notes and store them in Evernote, how I prioritise speed reading tips, motivation and concentration, and a bit about agile book clubs and resources out in the world. I've got 10 minutes, so I'll better get a move on. So please follow me or add me on Goodreads. My username is Tony Scrumptious. And I'm on Twitter as Tony Scrumptious and LinkedIn as Antonio Greenside Scrum Master. Catchy, hey? So I've been a Scrum Master since 2011. And that's when I started my Agile journey. And this system has evolved over time. I've been logging my general reading on Goodreads since 2012. So there are other book trackers out there, for example, Library Thing. But I've never used it, so I can't really comment on that. So first confession, I actually separated out my professional reading in 2016 into a separate Goodreads account. So the idea behind that was that I could share what I was reading. If people asked me to recommend a particular type of book, I could just send them to my Goodreads account and, and hopefully it could, be, could become a useful resource for lots of people to use. So there are a bewildering amount of agile books out there. So. I wanted to use a framework. So this is often referred to as the Agile X-Wing. So it has a Creative Commons attribute from the Agile Coaching Institute and was devised by Lisa Adkins and others. At the top is the overarching Agile Lean Practitioner knowledge. On the right, professional coaching and facilitating. On the left, teaching and mentoring, the difference there being whether you are the person with the knowledge or the person working with a group. At the bottom, you've got three domains, technical, business and transformation mastery. The idea here being you would have a toe in each of those, but you would choose one as your speciality. For me, it's transformation mastery. So 
When I was at primary school, my mum was actually the school librarian. So even before I started school, I knew about the Dewey Decimal System, alphabetizing and shelving books. Now, Goodreads lets you set up your own shelves. The default are all read, currently reading, want to read. Was that enough for me? Oh no, I wanted to set up a whole load more. So this is super geeky, so confession time. Yep, I have shelved books as per the Agile X-Wing. So I add on books that I find in bibliographies, at the end of chapter recommendations, maybe in the text as I'm reading a book, at a talk, so I'm going to add on the books that Liz has just recommended, at conferences, at meetups, during training from InfoQ, so all sorts of different places. And I'm a bit of a hoarder, so I have added on here more books than I could ever possibly read. But it's great to have this as a resource that I can go to if I ever want to find out books about, say, for example, Teams. So next, um, this is my sort of non-prioritization system, which I'm going to talk about later. And at the bottom, some administration. So it means I can locate where the books are, whether it's on my Kindle, a Kindle sample, loaned to a colleague, now that's quite a good one to keep track of, and physical copy owned. I have figured I do need to add on ebook because I have quite a few of those as well. And I find a lot of my physical books secondhand, so in charity shops, used to be in the physical charity shops, now online. Um, I buy from Amazon Marketplace, I buy direct from authors, I sometimes even buy brand new books. So again, this is really geeky, but Goodreads is really configurable. So I set up all of these shelves with different column headings. So I've got a cover, the title, the author, the number of pages. So I can sort by whether it's going to be a, a long, hard slog or something I can read really, really quickly. The average rating, if lots of people have given it four or five stars, it's probably worth reading. Date published. So it's going to be a bit different if it was published in the 1970s as opposed to published this year. Um, my rating and um, my rating system, five star everybody should read this book and another confession this is a blatant plug for this book so um it's not actually published yet but it's in progress on epub and i had a bit of a sneaky peek so have a look at that living complexity um so the shelves are shown the date read the date added whether i own it or not and the format and i've configured all of my shelves in the same way so how do i prioritize so I run a sort of filter system. So a scrum master has to be proactive and reactive. So I've learned not to set out a syllabus of books to read because something will always come along. Global pandemic, anyone? So in my filter, I've got maybe something that a mentor has recommended, maybe a particular author such as Jeff Watts. I might decide I'm gonna read all of his books and then a topic. So, for example, remote facilitation, better get on with that right now. And these filter down to one work in progress, limiting whip limits for any can banners. And I keep that as one. So stop starting, start finishing. The plus one is that I also have one non work book ongoing. So going back to my Goodreads account, I've set up an often recommended shelf. So those books that I really think I really should be reading, they get recommended at every single conference that I go to, I add into this column. I've also added in books that I have read. So continuing a theme, you can see there Jeff Watts's Coach's Casebook. And I can also refer other people to that to have a look through. So I filter these off onto a, a next list. And I filtered this one at the top by whether or not I own it, because I might as well read something I've already got. Right. I'm going to show you a big confession now. This is something that I did quite early on in my career. This is how I once prioritised. On an Excel spreadsheet, I was a certified Scrum professional qualification. At the time, you could either choose to do an exam or 
um, accumulate scrum education units. I decided I was going to work my way through the book list and I put them all in an Excel spreadsheet. I collated the number of pages in each book. I then figured out how many pages from each of those books I felt I needed to read. So some of them I was just reading the first couple of chapters. And then I sized them as per the number of pages and I gave them a um, a number based on how knowledgeable I felt I was in each subject and then got priorities. I mean, this is super geeky. This was me trying to um, put into play the things that I'd, that I'd learned. So I started working my way through the list and changing the, the, the row to green as and when I'd read them. So carrying on, um, I was working my way through that. So when I was checking in with my mentor, I could show him what I'd read. But I kept getting distracted and I kept adding on new books onto the bottom. But it's really not maintainable because, as we know, there are so many different books out there. But hey, I tried it. I wouldn't recommend it. So getting distracted and reading different books takes me on to the subject of concentration. So when reading, um, it can be a good idea to listen to nonverbal music. And if you check out this page on Headspace, it goes into the science of that. And also you can access music that has been specifically designed to help you focus. It's not for everyone, but you can give it a try. Also the Pomodoro technique. So these little tomato timers, um, you set the timer for 25 minutes, focus intently on what you're doing, take a break for five minutes, repeat, repeat, and then take a longer break. Um, that can be really handy. I am quite fortunate that I can hyperfocus as I'm reading. Um, so when I get into it, you can't disturb me. I can sometimes go full days reading and not do anything else, um, but they're useful techniques. Um, speed reading. So I'm very active when I read. I must point out that this is a book that I own. I would not dream of doing this on a borrowed book. So I highlight, I write notes. And a key thing here is to not reread the same thing over and over. So it's a good idea to use a pointer. It could be your finger in the column. Um, it could be using a pen like this, highlighting on Kindle, highlighting on an ebook, um, note taking completely separately. So you can, you can Google ways to increase your reading speed. This is just what works for me. So how I take notes. Um, I used to have a subscription to Safari Online, uh, which was provided by a company that I worked for. It was absolutely brilliant until I left the company and then I lost all of my notes. Um, but a method that I started doing was taking a copy of the contents table. And as I read through, I'd tick off my progress. So it was almost like breaking it down in smaller pieces. Hey, how agile of me. And I'd also write notes or put stars or put book recommendations at the bottom here. You can see a TED talk recommended. And if I own the book, I'll fold it up and put it inside the actual book. But if I don't own the book, let's look at different ways of filing notes. So how I store notes on Evernote. So the basic version is free, it's available across devices. You can store scanned handwritten notes and keywords allow cross-referencing. Now it's time for my biggest confession. I don't actually really use Evernote. I use this file and it's pink. I hate pink, but hey, I've got a pink file. So I had intended to transfer all my notes as a lockdown project, but that didn't happen, so sorry. <laughs> Moving on, um, Agile book clubs, resources out in the world, there's all sorts. So different people like learning in different ways. There's podcasts, there's videos, there's book reviews, there's all sorts of things out there. And a big confession, we read one chapter every week, it's not for me. Book clubs are not my thing, so I can't really recommend them. But one place I do really like to go to for book recommendations is InfoQ. Um, it's very up to date, keeps my finger on the pulse as to what's going on, and it gives um, a general interview with the author so I can see if I think a book's worth reading. If so, I'll add it onto my list. And that is me. Thank you very, very much for listening.
Jeff Unsen, and today I'm going to talk about an alternative way to teach story points and planning poker. So a little bit about myself, JF is my nickname, it stands for John Francis, which is my first name. I've been working in Silicon Valley for the past 30 years now. I first encountered the beginnings of Agile in the mid to late 90s, when I came across interesting discussions on net news. Anyone remember that? That was the web before we knew it. So at that time, I was a burnt out engineering architect and was fo following some interesting threads on net news. Agile wasn't even coined then, and I decided to try things out with my development team. Needless to say, my entire team and I were extremely surprised with the results, and I've been on my journey since then. So what's the problem with story points and planning poker? Why have an alternative way to teach it? Well, when I first encountered story points, I could understand the theory behind it, but I was having a hard time making the leap to actual practice. It took a very long time to click in my head, probably about a year before the light bulb finally turned on. So in addition to that learning curve, my team and I would spend lots of hours playing planning poker, especially when you had a very big backlog with a lot of items. We would get tired and start doing really bad shortcuts. And when I started coaching and training people at Yahoo back in 2005, all the teams that I'd coached went through the same problems. Most teams were having a hard journey to switch to story points. It took them as well time to understand and I saw a lot of dysfunction as a result. For example, teams taking the highest estimate someone gave or teams taking an average between two to cut down time for planning poker. So I started thinking, how can I make this easier? How can I get teams to adopt story pointing faster? And I had an aha moment sometime in 2008. And I decided to experiment on my engineering team at that time, which was at a startup and I was the uh, engineering director. So let me set the stage. I'm going to ask you a question, uh, but one caveat, please don't overthink about the answer to the question. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. All right, hopefully you can all see that. Good, all right. So what's the first thing you think of when you hear the following? Honey, can you change the light bulb? Any thoughts? For most people, something that comes up immediately is, oh yeah, that's simple, it's easy. We come up with adjectives to describe the type of work. So in this case, changing a light bulb is easy and simple, right? Is it really that easy? What if the light bulb was in the chandelier in Versailles? or if the light bulb was the Pigeon Point Lighthouse, right? Whatever the case, whatever the bulb is, there is a classification that already goes in our head when we see what we're being asked to do. And so I came up with these kinds of classifications with my team. So when we work on something, we inherently classify things as something simple, something as doable, something that's difficult, or something that's impossible and unknown. And we do this all the time, whether conscious or not. So I asked my team, what, so in, for this team, what, what I asked myself, what if I change story points and use this classification instead? So I introduced to my team these four categories and this light bulb exercise. I told them to classify the change the light bulb tasks. So the first one, change the light bulb on the desk lamp, team was like, yeah, simple. Great, put it on simple. Next one, light bulb on chandelier in Versailles. Hmm, a lot of questions. Are we allowed to change the bulb? What bulb does it use? What happens if we break the chandelier by accident in the process? All these questions, the team finally decided, that's probably something difficult. What about um, Pigeon Point Lighthouse? Pigeon Point Lighthouse is about 30 minutes drive from where I live here in California. Everyone knew about the lighthouse, but no one had any information of the bulb, the type of bulb, how it's removed, and then how it's mounted. So that the team put it in impossible and unknown. I then had my team put all the other items in these light bulb task buckets. You know, things like change the spotlight on top of a three-story building, install U light strip, or change the laser array at a club or a disco, 
or change the lasers at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center over here. So teams did this and they started bucketing all these into these four different categories. I then took the team and told them, let's take a look at the simple ones. Even within the simple ones, there are gradations. Simplest, simpler, simple. So I asked them, why don't you try and bucket these items into these three gradations? So they started off with changing the desk lap bulb. They, they thought it was the simplest one. They felt changing the fluorescent tube was a little harder than the desk lamp. Why? Well, the solution depended on the source of the problem. Was it the actual fluorescent tube that was the problem or was it the ballast? They felt the problem was similar for the flood lamp and so they put it along with the fluorescent tube. And of course, the next thing they said was that it was, that was a little more complicated was the 500 bulb Christmas light series. Why? It only takes one bulb, one broken bulb, and the whole light set wouldn't work. Replacing the bulb was easy, but finding which bulb was busted in that 500 bulb series, that would take a lot of time. So it was not as easy as people thought. Um, now, what about the 25, the, the bulb 25 feet up, up the stairs? Well, the team couldn't figure it out. It, was it more complicated than the 500 bulb Christmas light? Or was it the same? I tabled that question for the moment, but then I also introduced to the team, let's, 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 let's um, make it simple by categorizing this as S1, S2, S3, or simple one, simple two, simple three. Now I asked the team, what if you do the same thing with normal things or doable things or difficult yet achievable things? So in this case, here's the normal bucket with some of the bulbs that the team put in there. And here were the categories that I showed the team, e easier normal, normal, and slightly harder normal. I couldn't find a word that would really describe these. So these were the things that they came up with, but the team was fine with this definition. I then renamed it normal one, normal two, normal three. And I did the same thing for the difficult bucket, renaming it as D1, D2, D3. In the end, I had these nine buckets and I had a single bucket for impossible or unknown, which I just said, call, let's call it unk. So now going back to the first four simple bulb items, I now had the team lay out the stickies on this horizon from simple one to unk. I then told them instead of, you know, I, instead of playing planning poker, the other part of this solution was to do this thing do silent story bucketing. What is that? Basically, now that you know that there's uh, this range from simple all the way to difficult and unknown, I told the team, take an item or a sticky, in this case, change the bulb above the stairs that's 25 feet up, and silently, no conversation between people, put or move the sticky into the bucket you think it belongs to. So they did this with the sticky, and they finally decided it was a little more complicated than the Christmas bulb lights and put it in normal one. I then asked them to start doing it for all the other light bulbs in this exercise, silently, of course. And so they started moving things. And since there were a lot of stickies, people would grab one and place it in parallel. So, you know, nobody could, you know, everybody was just looking at all the stickies at the same time. And they continued to do this. And at some point, I started to notice one card was being pushed back and forth between two locations, difficult to and impossible and unknown. At that point, I said, let's stop for a moment. It seems like Mike and Samantha can't agree on the Pigeon Point Lighthouse bulb. Let's start with Mike. Why do you think it's a difficult two or a D2? And Mike said, I have a friend whose grandfather was a lighthouse keeper. I can probably ask him. Great. Okay, Samantha, your turn. Why is it impossible? Well, I know for a fact that the bulb is no longer being manufactured by anyone. The manufacturer ceased operations 40 or 50 years ago. No one knows how to even make that type of bulb that they used in that lighthouse anymore. So once Mike and Samantha explained, I told my team, okay, now that you've heard what they said, let's go back to silently bucketing these tickets. And after that discussion, the light bulb ticket remained in the unknown. And the team continued to move stickies into various 
positions on that continuum. And at some point, the movement stopped. When the movement stopped, I told them the team, the meeting's over. And what did you, what you just did was assign story points to these items. Because now I changed the buckets into their pseudo Fibonacci counterparts and voila, we did story pointing in less than 15 minutes with this introduction. The team immediately got what story points meant. And I then had uh, proceeded to have them do silent story bucketing with our backlog items. So in the end, from then on, it was very easy to story point our backlog items. They didn't call out numbers like what people do, it's five or an eight. Instead, they, they latched onto the adjectives. That's a simple one. No, I disagree. That's a normal two. So they were having conversations using those shortened adjectives. And I used this technique, not just at the startup, but I since then used it at three other companies with very much the same success. People found it easier to understand and easier to do story pointing using this method. So now you have an alternative to story pointing and planning poker. Thank you very much. Just before I start, um, this turned out a little bit differently than I anticipated. And it was written especially for this forum, um, but it was written 10% more for the lovely Tony Greensides, because last year about this time, she asked me for a recitation and I was too shy. So this is me getting over that. The sorry tale of a project fail by me. True story, Farah. Welcome, my friends. Do gather round for grisly a tale as can be found. Well, not quite grisly, but still a tale of mistakes and woe and project fail. Perchance you'll blanch when I confess this project seemed like a success. We iterated and delivered. At release sign-off, I barely quivered, confident all would be impressed. Imagine then quite how distressed I was to find they did not care. They behaved as if I wasn't there. When I returned to face my team, I tried to smile and make it seem as if their work was well received, but I could tell they weren't deceived. We had done well, yet somehow, sadly, I'd failed my team so very badly. With time gone by, I can look back and see the places I lost track. To start with, I was not courageous. I found low trust meetings were contagious. The managers saw a scrum master as a whip to make the teams work faster. And add to that a weekly forum where we all maintained utmost decorum. Dare to paint your project ungreen and you'd be seen to contravene the sacred code of reporting status and find your career put on hiatus. Such was the climate of cold fear. But that's no excuse to be unclear green project has no meaning. In fact, it's rather overweening if it means we all pretended until the project nearly ended. When the truth bursts out overnight, green flips to red in an almighty mess of apparent sudden failure of the most catastrophic nature. And remember, it runs both directions, red to green, as we make corrections. Our project red did din to amber, 
and breathless to true green we did clamber but they didn't care for i didn't say what really happened on the way i learned that it's imperative to tell an honest narrative these days yeah i'll get my ears chewed off but afterwards, my cap I doff to higher ups who appreciate knowing that I'm talking straight. They get that it lets them plan too and helps us to find the breakthrough to mitigate the current risk so we can deal with it in brisk, efficient ways or at least warn the business of a looming thorn. And slowly, they begin to trust we will not suddenly combust. There's power in transparency to avoid mistrust and hostility. It might not be all laughs and smiles, but it's better when we share our trials. For in the end, what's truly tragic is believing that success is magic so that's it my tale to tell um but one more thing before we say farewell if i have not bored you to utter tedium you can read more from me on the website medium thank you found a way um to make your life better, 24% better in nine months, you wouldn't keep it to yourself, would you? You'd go out and tell people about it, especially if all you needed to get started with it was this. In fact, you might even be forgiven for turning up to something like, say, Cambridge Agile Exchange and talking about it, even though it's got nothing much to do with Agile. Or has it? You decide. So let's, let me show you how it works. So this is the first of the month and I take my five colours and I work out what I want to do every day that month and associate one thing that I want to do, one habit that I want to develop with each of those colours. Then if we move to uh, a day in the month, so let's use today, um, I'll colour in uh, a segment um, to denote that I've done that particular thing on that particular day. So this, this, um, this practice reminded me of something that I'd read about in this book um, by Marshall Goldsmith. Um, but the thing that he describes, I mean, this is a brilliant book and, and really helped me. Um, but one of the things I didn't um, take on was his, was his daily questions um, because there was just too much investment to get started with it. You had to find somebody to ring you up at the same time every day and fill in a spreadsheet and it, it all just didn't, didn't appeal. And so the, the, the way this, the, the method that I'm telling you about now won out was that it was just so easy to get started with. So let's make this a bit more concrete and I'll tell you what my um, current five habits are. These are the habits that I'm tracking. Um, but what's most interesting about these is, I think for this audience is why I chose them. So I'm just gonna go through, the, the, through them one at a time and explain why. So the first one, um, fortunately I can cover very quickly because it's already been mentioned this evening is Pomodoro. So I wanted to do at least one period of uh, 25 minute um, focusing on one task every day. Um, I've got a particular way of doing that, um, which you can read about in, on my blog. The second habit was to meditate. Um, and the reason, the reason I picked this was, that it was something that was suggested for me because I was uh, describing the, the kinds of problems that you, that you see here that I've quoted from the book. Um, and uh, there's, there's sort of science that links um, links the cure for those to um, mindfulness and, and meditation. So I wanted to try and get that habit going. Um, if we just take those first two habits that I've talked about, there's something 
uh, that they've got in common. Um, they're both about managing attention. And during this period that I'm talking about, this was one of the one of the ideas that really hit home was that your attention is like a muscle. And the more you learn to control it, the more you'll be able to control it. So moving on to the third habit, this is a nice simple one. Walk for at least 20 minutes. I think you pro you've probably heard the advice that you should take at least 20 minutes exercise every day. Um, I think it's almost as well known as eating five fruit and veg. Um, but it was interesting while I was putting this talk together, this tweet popped up um, from Roy, who, who some of you may know through this group, um, which talked about um, exercise and its link to, to good sleep. Um, the article also went on um, to talk about um, priorities and health and well-being. And so I to me that, that related to both of these um, habits because they're both a chance to step back. Um, they give me a bit more space and, and give me a chance to think again about, you know, remind me what my priorities really are and don't get locked into whatever happens to be in front of me. So the fourth habit is an odd one out really. Um, it's finished something. So um, work in progress limits were mentioned earlier as well. Um, and this is, that's part of what informed this. Um, if, you're, if you've heard of uh, Meredith Belbin's work on team roles, I'm not much of a completer finisher, um, but obviously things do need finishing. Um, and this is, probably of the five habits this is the one that I've thought the most about and there's a there's a blog post about that as well um, and these two habits I think have something in common they're both examples of nudges so the change that I've made in my life is just that I'm going to colour in a square in a particular colour every day um, but they have been enough to bias my behaviour towards noticing things that could be finished off and towards getting started or getting moving on things because I'm only investing 25 minutes at a time. So there's something else that joins those together as well. Um, you may be, you may have picked up that I'm, some of the things that I was thinking about were to do with motivation, my own motivation. Um, I'd come across the idea in this book that you can, um, if you create forward momentum in meaningful work, you have a more satisfying inner work life. And there's really strong research in this book uh, that backs that up. So I'll cover the fifth one very quickly because it's quite straightforward. And I just saw this poster at work. Um, and that's, that's what inspired it. Let's look at some actual data from early on in this process. So let's go back to April 2019. Now, the first and most striking thing about this is this is April. I started in January, so it's already more successful than any attempt at New Year's resolutions I've ever had. You'll also notice that the colours are not the colours I've told you about because I hadn't really, they hadn't settled down yet and they're sort of swapping between places and there's that strange hatching of the green on the 12th, which I have no idea what that meant. So let's clean that up for you for the purposes of the presentation. And if we count up the number of uh, segments that were possible and the number that were actually filled in, uh, you can get a score, if you like, of 39%. Let's wind forward nine months to January this year. And if you do the same thing, you'll see that 63% are filled in. And that means that my life got 24% better in nine months. Now I can already hear the objections, even though you're all on mute, that that's not the same as my life getting better. Um, but the, the, the experience that I had over that period is, I think, consistent with that level of that level of improvement. Um, but um, I do have a few I'm not uh, I do have a few confessions to make. Um, so the first one is that if, if the whole story of that period is a steam locomotive, then all I've told you ab about tonight is, is the, the care of the firebox, the bit where the energy comes from and the drive. Second confession, it's not my idea. I saw it on Twitter. Um, it's uh, Sean McCabe and his five habit tracker. Um, I'll also mention at this point that I'm gonna post a link in the chat and I'll put it on the Slack uh, workspace as well um, with a link to all of the things that I've mentioned in this talk. Another confession is that I've now taken it a bit further. 
Um, one of the most powerful parts of this technique is that eventually you'll start to get a streak of consecutive um, days when you've done a particular habit and you can see that I'm up into the hundreds on three of them and that creates quite a bit of uh, incentive to keep them going. Weekly and monthly habits, that's not working particularly well. Another one that works really well is upgrades. So rather than just walking 20 minutes or a mile, walking three miles gets me a different colour and getting on my bike instead gets me a different colour. It's possible that I may have taken this a bit too far. So what I'm doing here is I've taken the four habits and I've put them in the box at the bottom and then I've taken the, the fifth one and the, the orange one and the upgrades and put them at the top because they're, they're sort of slightly out of my control. Um, but the things, the idea is the things inside the box are things that I should, I still believe I should be able to do consistently every day. And so we can look at the uh, data for the whole, uh, you know, the entire data set so far. Um, and if we if we think about the boxes and um, what we're really looking at there is a measure of my self-discipline. It looks like that. So I think the, the real message in this in this slide is changing behaviour is hard and it's slow. But I don't want you to be too demoralised by that message. Let's go back and remember that all it takes on a particular day is this. That's all you need to look at. And something's just happened, hasn't it? Yep, I finished something. So if you've got reactions to this, there's the hashtag. That's me on Twitter. That's the company that I work for. I'd like to thank them for the time and space to put this presentation together. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Uh, okay, there. so hi there. My name's uh, Lee Abrahams and I am an Agile Delivery Manager at a company called Origami. We are, I guess, what you would call a scale-up. We're not quite a startup anymore, but we're still a, a, st a small company. Um, and we are a tech company in the renewable energy um, space. And uh, the talk that I'm going to be giving today is on Agile metrics. So it's using Agile metrics to set achievable sprint goals and create delivery plans. Um, so just quickly on the agenda, so I'm going to just quickly go through, um, first of all, just highlight the problem that we were looking to, looking to solve, uh, the solution that we came up with, um, how the solution was created, and a little bit about if you're looking to try this for yourself, how you can give it a go. Uh, so the problem. So the team want to set uh, achievable sprint goals, um, and because, you know, sprint goals, that's the setting the sprint goal that's getting the the team working in cohesion working towards something and it's really something you want to be able to get um to be using uh, sprint goals however if they're not achievable it can be demotivating for the team if you're regularly not achieving your sprint goals so we wanted to be able to set achievable sprint goals um and by set we're setting these achievable sprint goals we wanted to take into account um the availability because not all sprints are created equally uh, you might have a different number of people in the team because some are on holiday. You might have people working on a lot of spikes. You might have people working on interviews, uh, something like that. And we wanted to be able to um, plan these achieve these sprint goals um, quickly. The second thing was in we said we were in the renewable um, tech world, so we are a B two B company, um, and customers want to know when stuff will be delivered, um, and we want to be able to tell them when stuff is going to be delivered. And when doing this, what we don't want to do is to disrupt the team for estimates and updates on progress. We want to leave them to get on um, with doing their development. I don't want to be saying to an engineer, how long do you think this is going to take? What's your progress through? When's this, when's this big project going to get, going to get completed? Um, and also with the, the nature of Agile, it means you can discover things as you go. Um, so we needed to set this customer expectation accordingly. We didn't want to set, be setting like a hard and fast deadline that you'll get this by this date. There's, we need to be able to set that um, expectation that things can be, can be discovered as we go. Um, so the solution, the root of the solution is data. So the data that we're looking at is cycle time. So for us, cycle time um, is how many working days between development starting on the ticket and it being moved to done. Um, and we're also looking at cycle time per point. Um, so that's just the, num the number of story points assigned to the ticket um, divided by the cycle time. We and oh yeah, here's a quick um, 
showing this is actually the real cycle time from one of the teams. Um, so we're having a look at there. Uh, and then velocity. So velocity to us is the number of story points brought into a sprint versus the number of story points completed. Um, and again, just a quick graph there. That's um, a real velocity from the team. And then finally, the last metric, um, the last bit of uh, data we were using was capacity. Now for us, capacity meant how many working days can members of the team spend working on pointed work, so tickets with story points. This is all data um, that we had that we were looking to use. So what were we doing? So if you're looking at the planning solution, so we're looking, sorry, to the, the issue with, we wanna be able to set achievable sprint goals because the sprint, the sprint goals that we're setting are regularly not being met, that can be demotivating. Um, you know, it, it can affect how you can predict when things are gonna be getting done. So what we did was a bit of a change up the planning. So using some historic data, so there's a, just a quick screenshot of some of that historic data that I pulled out. So the cycle term per point, the velocity, velocity per man day, some other symmetric and stuff that we're here, historical data, plus the team saying their capacity. So when it comes to planning, um, that's sort of saying in here. So uh, Anna's got, um, you know, she might be saying, I've got, I've got a spike that's going to be a day and a half. Um, we've got um, Chris who is um, saying, you know, I've got, I've got to say prep to this interview that's coming up. Um, and then I'm, you know, I've got this interview, so I've, look, I'm really not on sort of pointed work for the next, the next couple of days. And then quite frankly, Rick's just got some holiday at the end there. So we're taking into account how many um, man days we have in planning. Um, and what that gives us, um, we can use that data. So the capacity in that historic data to give us a sprint prediction. And this sprint prediction here um, is a range. Because as I said, there's the unpredictable nature of Agile. You might discover things as you go. Um, you may have misestimated. You know, there's some unknowns in there. Um, so therefore, you always want to kind of give that sprint prediction of a range. You've kind of got your blue, so that's like best case green, sort of your most likely, uh, and amber as, if, as we're kind of discovering. So well, that's an estimate there of how many story points does this team think do we think we can get in a sprint using that historic data, using um, the team's uh, capacity as, as they've said it. So. That's one problem solved. So that's helping us get those more achievable um, sprint goals. As you saw from the velocity plan, it was all kind of starting to match up towards the end. That was helping us set those more realistic um, sprint goals and taking into account changes such as new people joining the team, people leaving the team and, and that kind of changes to there. So we use that. So now we're going on to the problem I was talking about, which were customers. Um, we work in a B2B world. These customers want to know, when am I gonna get this thing? um you told me it'd be this state yeah but we you know we uncovered something and it and it you know it took a little bit longer and we had to you know i don't care you, you kind of committed to this date so how do we go about giving these dates and how do i not distract um the team by asking them when are you going to get this what's the progress how are we looking so what we did here for with the four was create um forecasts for when things would be delivered so again that same data i've got my historic data that i was talking about um, so my cycle times, my velocities, my cycle time per point, my velocity per per man day. You know, I've got these metrics that I'm building up just nat just naturally through the course of getting through work. Um, here, so we've got the forecasting plus the capacity. We've got our story points here because teams have been. We've got some work that's story pointed. Um, we've got also some unsized work as well. So accounting for the historic data plus the story points plus the unsized work. What do we want to do with this? Well, we want to create a, a data-driven estimate of when this will get done. So you're saying, what's our delivery one? Yeah, how many people are on it? Number of people in the team that can dedicate to this, or number of people, number of people in a team, or number of people in that team because we've split this up. What's its story pointed at? How many unknowns do we have? Let's crunch that historic data and let's get a prediction of roughly how many working days um, we we think so we've got a range so you're setting that expectation with the customer you're saying look you know best case you know we think it's probably going to take us about 19 working days but you know there's this there's this range here and just naturally because you're re redoing these estimates you sort of in your weekly meetings with your customers and your internal stakeholders as you naturally get closer to that completion date there's fewer unknowns you've uncovered you've worked through some of the issues you can get that more accurate estimate so over time these date ranges are getting more more and more um, accurate and sort of less facing. And also as the team are getting more used to pointing and getting better at that as well and getting a better idea of what the sizing, you start to start get less of a range actually um, with, the, um, with the sizes. So what is a blue, amber and, amber and green? So 
Um, what do I do with that with that data then? So I've got that, I've done my predictions there, I've taken that data, I've got a prediction. What am I going to do for our customers and internal and internal stakeholders to keep them happy, give them these forecasts? Well, I can just transform that data into something that looks like this. So just transforming it into a forecast plan that they can understand and see here's our progress through. You know, as you, as I was saying, this is actually this is actually create, all created with real data, by the way. But you can so you can see here that you know as we're getting clo closer to completing, the delivery range is you still set an expectation that things can change. You're like here's the amber. That delivery range kind of gets smaller. Um, the, the stuff that's further out, yes, you've got a big bit bigger of a range, but you're still kind of managing that expectation with the customer. You've created this. The team are just doing their normal thing of pointing when it comes to planning they're just sort of saying here's my capacity um, and then you're just crunching data and you can produce that plan and you can see the progress through um, without having to go to your um, go to your team and putting unnecessary sort of stress and burn on them saying when is this going to be done what's what's this here so this all just gets created um, purely with data so let me just explain a little bit about what's behind this um, so the data is just exported from jira um, so you're just taking the time it was moved into dev, time it was moved into done. You've got your story points and you've got your stories, your structured, your linked into epics and features. And that kind of relates back to your deliverable that I was showing on there. You've then got your engineers. Um, they size work with story points where possible. Sometimes they can't size it. You take into account that with the unknown. Sometimes, you know, it, maybe it's a bug we really don't quite know, but maybe we've got some we've got some spikes and we can't that, but they're sizing where they can and they just fill in that capacity um, at the start at the start of a sprint. Um, you've got your product team. So they are grouping the tickets into um, customer customer deliverables. So stuff that like a customer can understand that you know, we can communicate to a customer, here's our progress towards this deliverable. So that's using the epics and the features. And then it's just the case of some Excel formulas um, that I'm crunching with network days is the number of working days between two dates. And you've got stuff in there, which is percentile. Um, so I'm saying, you know, my 95th, 75th, 50th percentile to help give me that kind of a range of like best case, worst case. Um, so that's uh, that's what we've I've we been doing to help solve that to help solve those two um, those two problems, and if anyone is interested in having a look at this, having a play, having a look at the data, because um, I'm saying it is real data that we pulled from the team and real forecasts and real plans and stuff here. If anyone is interested, if you just shoot me an email, um, I'll send you some templates. So I've got some templates of data in there to have a play with, um, and you can yeah you can see here you can. I've got the data one, a load of data here. You can have a play with the planning spreadsheet. You can have a play with forecasting, um, and I've got I've got a uh, a forecast plan, anonymized to uh, what the liberals are. But we've got a bit of a forecast plan that was there used with real data as well. You can kind of see what is produced. So, um, thank you very much, and uh, that's that's me. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, so this. Um... This talk maybe should have been called uh, how you can compare your team's metrics and what that might tell you, but that's nowhere near as clickbaity as uh, why you should be co comparing your team's metrics. So let's let's kick off. Um, there's a few prerequisite assumptions here. Uh, you know, metrics in the wrong hands can be quite uh, dangerous. Um, we want to try and avoid confirmation bias, etc. We need safety to talk about them. All topics for another lightning talk. We're going to assume that we're going to use these metrics in the right way. So let's jump in and start comparing straight away. So let's start with uh, metrics that are either mentioned in the Scrum Guide or sometimes uh, maybe incorrectly um, thought of as part of Scrum. So burn downs referenced in the Scrum Guide. So we should all be like Team Two, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I'd argue that Team One spent a few days working, found out uh, something, learned something, brought something into their sprint. They maybe didn't deliver everything, but uh, maybe they delivered something that was, was valuable that they learned along the way. Team two, hey, they probably spent three months trying to plan how to make that perfect burn down of two points every day for the whole sprint. Let's move on to velocity. Uh, story points, um, so not used in the Scrum Guide, uh, or not mentioned in the Scrum Guide, but quite often used uh, with, with Scrum teams. So we want to be like Team 2, right? They're delivering loads more than Team 1. Uh, maybe, maybe not. You know, uh, I don't think that story points is, uh, is, is something that we can compare across teams. 
Uh, in this example, team, uh, team one was asked, why are you not working as hard as team two? And they adjusted their story points. Uh, and from sprint four onwards, we're doing quite well. And you can guess what happened next. Team two were asked the same. And suddenly a, a one point was a two point tomorrow, a four point the next day and, and thereafter. Um, so velocity, I don't think we can compare velocity across teams. CFD, this is use, uh, mentioned in the, the Scrum Guide. Loads of useful information, but the top one I don't think is actually a CFD. It's dropping down, as you can see, but um, I don't know how we would compare those two teams. Um, you know, they're, they're quite hard to read anyway. Comparing across two teams is probably, uh, probably impossible. So let's move on. But I think with flow metrics, we're, we're on the right direction. Uh, up here, we've got... Um, sort of uh, aging work in progress. This is great uh, leading, leading indicators of, of how the team's doing. Got some lagging metrics here of, of throughput and cycle time. So I think this is all stuff that's, that's really useful to capture and, and you know, in your typical software teams. Um, these are the sorts of things that we should be measuring. But even comparing this, you know, people's cycle times are gonna vary. You know, different teams are gonna be working on different types of work. So I think we're onto something, but in this format, we can't quite compare it. So how do we, how do we compare it? Well, we can take the data that we've captured in our, in our flow metrics, uh, we can normalize it and then take some trends. So this is uh, the bit of the geeky bit. We'll pour it into our normalization funnel, filter it between zero and one. Um, then we'll, we'll plot that on a graph and we'll, we'll do some linear regression and try and find our, our line of best fit. Um, we, we can do this with all our team's data. It will remove outliers and anything skewing the data and it should normalize. So if one team um, cycle times are slightly longer than another, it will, it will normalize that data. So once we've got that, we can then plot this data. You'll see on the X and Y axis that the, there is no um, scale to it. Um, but we can see here that we've got a trend line of all of our teams uh, in this organization or product organization and a subject team in blue. So we can start to see here that the team in question here is, is trending slightly better uh, than, than the whole organization as a whole. So this is really useful. Um, you, you know, we've normalized our data. We're starting to look at trends, which I think trends are, are, are where we want to look, especially if we're, if we're comparing. Um, but this is quite a blinkered view. We've just taken one piece of uh, data, um, but we need to think about a bigger picture, especially if we're gonna be comparing teams. So what can we measure? Well, we kind of talked about this with flow metrics. We can just measure start date, end date, and, and our work type. And then we've got four of our six competing metrics um, and we can then compare them. So what are these competing metrics? Well, if, uh, if anyone follows uh, Troy McGuinness's um, uh, a newsletter, you may have seen this, and this is where um, sort of the, the typical pull and push of, of uh, how teams work. So if we do lots and lots of work, maybe our quality will drop and trying to balance that. So creating metrics around this is probably where we want to be. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on this sort of middle slice here. Uh, these are the output metrics. Um, we could also do this the same with um, uh, is what we're doing valuable and how is our team doing, but I haven't covered that today. So again, Troy McGuinness's uh, spreadsheets here, if you've used any of them, you'll, you'll probably be familiar with this. But you're starting to plot the data uh, and you're seeing your trends over time. And with your teams with this, you can start to make conscious choices about, um, you, you know, borrowing a bit of quality to up your throughput or something like that. So this, this is the sort of thing we could use when we're comparing. So if we take our normalized data and use these sorts of uh, competing metrics, we can then have something like this, which shows our whole organization. Now, this is really quite powerful in my opinion. We, we can see here that in this case, this team here is trending downwards quite rapidly. So assuming that you have many teams in your organization or many teams in your, your product organization, um, and you may or may not have one Scrum Master or one Agile Coach. So if we were looking at this data here, we would look at this team and say, well, something's happening with this team that's different to the whole organization as a whole. 
maybe we should focus our efforts on that team and, and understand why that's happening. But what was really powerful, if this was the other way around and we saw that the whole organization's teams were all trending down quite badly, maybe there's something outside of the teams that are affecting them. You know, it would be great to put some data into this when COVID uh, first came along and we'd see how that affected the whole teams. But this could be sort of leadership decisions, product decisions, things like that. So we could then work as uh, scrum masters, agile coaches outside of our teams, backed up with data informed um, information to, to go and work with leadership uh, members and product leadership members uh, and say, there's something going on here that's affecting all of our teams. Um, and what can we do to, to understand what that might be and how can we fix it? And if we fix it once outside of the team and it, it, it benefits 10 teams, 20 teams, hey, that's, that's time and money well spent, isn't it? So I think, you know, comparing teams data has a bit of a bad rep. Uh, and I think at the start we saw, you know, if you do it in some cases, it, it is not really the right way to do it. But done the right way, normalizing our data, looking at trends, you know, it could be quite a powerful tool in our toolbox. It could, uh, it could give us another view on what's happening within our organization uh, and allow us to sort of pool our, our coach and scrum master resources and focus within the team or outside of the team to better benefit those teams that are, that are working within the organization. So comparing data, how do you feel about it now? And that comes in just before the end of the session. So uh, hopefully it wasn't too quick. Thank you for your time.